Well, it is, it is great to be back. It's, it's always bittersweet when we come back from vacation because we, we go vacation, our family vacation every year. We go down to Hatteras, North Carolina. And one, re- one of the reasons our family loves going down to Hatteras, one of the reasons is fishing. Most of us that go, we love to get out fishing, and the fishing down there is just phenomenal. In fact, when we're down there, I like to get out as much as I possibly can. You know, you're on vacation, you're like, oh, I need to sleep in. I get up at 4.30 every morning when I'm on vacation because I want to get up and I want to enjoy the sunrise and I want to get on the beach and fish and all those things. And this year I was especially excited because I was bringing my kayak with, it, with me uh, on our vacation. So I get to fish off of that. And when we got down there, it was windy the first couple of days and it was kind of depressing in that because I'm wanting to get out so bad. And then Tuesday, the winds finally let up just enough to where maybe I could get out. So, so I took my kayak in my truck down the road to the launch and I launched out into the sound there and went out a couple miles out into the sound and I found this deep hole um, deep, a deep part and it was filled with speckled trout okay and that's really cool and in fact in, in probably an hour hour and a half I caught my limit of speckled trout which are just phenomenal and um, came back home, and it was, it, uh, you know, paddled back to the, to the launch. I was pretty excited. I'm just like, man, everything is going perfect. And that's when it happened. Don't you hate it when things are going perfect, and it seems like things are going so good, and you're like, it's almost too good to be true, and there's always that monkey wrench that goes in to trying to test that time. Well, here's what happened to me. I, get, I load the kayak back in my truck, and I drive back to our house, and I'm excited, Debbie's outside, she's waiting for me and everything, and I go and I'm backing the, backing the truck back underneath the house to, to kind of get the kayak off, and as I back up, I misjudge the distance, and I back the kayak right into the post of the house. And Debbie yells something, and I come out, and I look, and the whole front of my kayak is bent and, and all crushed in, and I'm just like, oh. Now, At that moment, I hit a crossroads. And here's what the crossroads is. I kind of hit this crossroads in our vacation. It was early on in our vacation. Things were going great. So was this going to derail the rest of the trip and kind of ruin the rest of the trip? Or do I remain positive, search for maybe a way to fix it, find the best that we can do, and move forward? And, you know, we find ourselves at crossroads like that, don't we, in life? Where things are going along and and then we hit this crossroads where everything could go really bad or things could move forward. In fact, this type of thing can happen in our lives and especially when it comes to relationships in our lives. Have you ever hit crossroads in relationships? No matter how good relationships may be, conflict happens, doesn't it? In every relationship, conflict happens. Maybe we get hurt by somebody saying or doing something to us, or, or we get offended by what somebody's done or said, or we, we fail each other, even in the best of relationships. And we face these times of conflict. And it's here we stand at a crossroads, right? Do we build or do we bust? Do we seek to move forward learning and growing from conflict? Or do we allow that conflict to fracture and destroy relationships? And you know, this is even more important when it comes to life in the church and relationships among believers. And here's why it's so important. is because we're called to have the unity, to, called to unity in the love of Jesus. And it's a way that we reflect Jesus. So when relationship conflicts happen and and problems happen, we can get in a lot of trouble. It can be a bad thing in church and with believers. And in light of this, Paul talks a little bit about these healthy relationships and conflict in relationships in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start reading even before you get there, but we'll be in there the whole, our whole message this morning. So you can kind of stay there. Here's what he says in the beginning of Ephesians 4, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond 
of peace. Now, what Paul's talking about in, about relationships here is he's presenting the ideal. This is what great relationships should look like. It's what it sh- they should be. Now, if you're like me, you look at this and you say, yeah, but I don't know if that's my experience. Unfortunately, this ideal isn't necessarily the reality, especially in the church today. In fact, the opposite of this is often true, isn't it? In relationships, even among believers. I mean, discouragement, broken relationships, strife, and drama are more often marks of the modern American church than is unity in the spirit. In fact, unresolved conflict has become the most common reason for people to leave a church. They leave over conflict with others. And it's one of the most common reasons for church tension in general. And even more troubling than this is as believers then leave churches because of unresolved conflict and they shuffle from church to church. We call that the shuffling of the saints. And they go from church to church. Most discover that a change of scenery isn't a cure for this kind of relationship conflict. And actually, history repeats itself because conflict has never been resolved. And all of this, it not only tears apart the church, but it also weakens our witness in our world as believers. As it looks little different from the broken relationships that exist in the world. And sometimes it looks even worse, doesn't it? Within the church. Have you ever experienced this? Have you ever experienced this kind of relationship conflict with other believers or in, within a church? You know, somebody says something hurtful. Somebody fails to care for us the way that, that we expect to be cared for. Or somebody breaks our confidence. And our world is sent reeling, isn't it? How could they do that? That's awful. And in our pain, we respond a couple different ways. Maybe we shut down just completely and we give up. We just say, never, I'm never reaching out again. I don't need friends. I don't need relationships, you know? Or maybe instead, we we say, no, I'm going to lash out. In fact, I'm going to talk bad about the person who offended me or did this to me to other people to try to gain support. Or we just go to the person, we blame them, and they become the source of all pain in our world, and then we walk away. You know, it's like we throw a hand grenade in the room and walk out. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been tempted, or has that ever happened to you? You know, it's painful to go through, no matter what side you're on. If you're the person that's been offended, or you're the person that unknowingly maybe offended somebody, and, they, and then it, it just blows up, and you don't know what happened. It can be difficult, can it? So how do we reverse the trend? How do we reverse this in the church? How do we, as Paul says, maintain unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? Reflect Jesus. That seems to elude so many believers in so many churches today. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. Um, I shared on the email that I wanted to share something that's very close to my heart, and this is something very close to my heart, because nothing's more painful that, that I've experienced than relationship conflict, and nothing can be so damaging as relationship conflict, can it? So I want to talk to you a little bit about building healthy relationships in an imperfect world with imperfect people just like us. You see, When we come to that critical crossroads, when relationships get messy, we need to learn to resolve conflict in a way that reflects Jesus. Now, fortunately for us, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul isn't finished talking about conflict and relationships. Actually, Paul shares some tools that are essential for building these healthy relationships towards the end of chapter 4. And I want to share them with you this morning as a way of us learning how we can deal with conflict in a healthy and in a godly way. So look down to verse 25. We're going to look there. 
So Paul's talking, and he's been talking about this kind of peace and unity and things like that. And he says, in light of all of this, verse 25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You see, when we come to saving faith in Jesus, when we become a believer, right, we embrace his truth, the truth about ourselves, the truth about God, the truth about Jesus dying for us, and we embrace that and, and hold on to it for ourselves in faith. You know what happens? We become a new creation, don't we? Second, Second Corinthians tells us that. Those who are in Christ are a new creation, which means we become free and complete in the person and work of Jesus. And this means that we're different. So we no longer need to lie to cover ourselves up to try to be better than we are because we're already complete in Christ. We no longer need to try to look better than we necessarily are or, or you know, to, to look more than we are. We can be, we're free to be honest. In fact, in this Paul shares the first of our tools for responding constructively in the midst of relationship conflict and that first tool is honesty. If we want to help resolve conflict when we have conflict with, with others, it starts here. When conflict and challenges begin to tear apart relationships, we build them back with being honest. Honest with ourselves, honest with God, and honest with each other. And this is important because, you know why? It's much easier to be dishonest. It's much more expedient sometimes to just get our point across, no matter how, whether it's true or not, or honest or not. We just want to get it out there, right? And it's much more... It's, it's much easier sometimes to believe a lie than it is the truth, but that often leads then to broken relationships. You know, we can be dishonest with ourselves when relationship conflicts happen, you know, and what that means is maybe we, we're dishonest with ourselves and we say, nope, I'm fine. That didn't hurt a bit. Nope, I'm good. You know, and really on the inside, we're falling apart. We're like, that really hurt. That really bothered me. But instead, we kind of suck it up, you know, suck it up, buttercup, and, and we kind of deny our hurt, and, and we never deal with it then. And it continues to grow in us, inside us, while we keep pushing it down. And then one day, it just explodes, because we were never honest. You know, and, um, you know, that lie then begins to define us and bring us down. And when we're dishonest with ourselves in this way, it also leads to us being dishonest with God. If we're sitting there, I'm fine. Then when we say we're fine, I don't need to go to God. I don't need to come to God and say, God, help me. God, I hurt. God, what am I to do? Because we're saying, well, everything's fine. So all of a sudden, we're not, we're not going to God and we're not being honest with him. And we try to put on that brave face, not admitting the pain or asking for healing, that he helps heal this ourselves and our relationship. That he wants to freely do. He's offered that. He says, I'll heal it. I'll come in and I'll heal that. And when we're not dishonest with God, then that can lead to us being dishonest with others. Which may include that we're dishonest with other people where a person offends us. So we go to other people and we start downing the person, tearing down the other person. Whether it's true or not, just to kind of gain support. Or we're dishonest with that person, you know. And we never, and we just keep it from them. We keep that, that they offended us. And we just never let them know their part in our pain. And what happens when we're dishonest like that? You know what happens when we don't tell somebody else when they've done that? Then that lie starts to grow in us. And maybe we start to say, you know what? They meant to do that. And oftentimes in conflict, especially amongst believers, People don't mean to hurt each other, and it just happens. So they might not even have known that they hurt you, but yet you're keeping that from them, and, and they never know. They never have a chance to grow, but also it starts to grow in you, and you start to say, no, they meant to do that, and then you start to put motives on a person. You start to say, they're a bad person. See, they don't care. They don't want anybody. In fact, they're out to hurt people. They're just a bad person. And all of a sudden, now you're not being honest about others. And it all kind of stems from that with us just being able to, 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 to look at ourselves and say, hey, you know, I want to I 
recognize this happened to me and I want to go to God. And then from that, we'll go from there. So Paul says, speak the truth to our neighbor. Who's our neighbor? He okay, again, you know, usually another believer, a fellow brother and sister in Jesus isn't out to hurt you. Okay, they're not evil. They're not out to ruin your life. They might not even know or intend, know or even intended, intended to hurt you. And therefore, when we don't come with them to honestly with how we feel, you know what we actually do? We rob them of an opportunity for them to grow or to know a way that they can improve on a weakness that they didn't even know exists. And now all of a sudden, we've broken the fellowship. Because we're trying to read something in. So, Paul says, be honest. It starts, if you want to start to rebuild, right? Const respond constructively in the midst of, of relationship conflict. Be honest. Be honest with yourself when you're hurt. And then bring it to God. He alone can bring healing. And you know what the amazing thing is? God often brings healing before we even have to go to the other person. We can go to God and say, this hurts, and he, he, he heals us. So then you know what happens when we go to the other person? We're not going to them with an, with a, where we're carrying an offense anymore, where we're carrying something against them. Rather, we can go to them and say, you know what? This is for your benefit. And instead of us pulling apart, I want to stand with you and help you with this. So I'm coming to you with this to say, hey, how can we get this better? And it draws us closer together. It all starts with honesty is what Paul is saying, right? And this honesty, it's proactive. It doesn't just happen on its own. And this is why Paul says this next. Go down to the next verse, 26. So he says, in light of being honest, he says also, be angry and do not sin. Okay? So it's okay to be angry. It's okay if somebody offends you for you to be hurt. But he says, don't sin. Well, how don't you sin? He says, well, do not, let the anger, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity for the devil. So what Paul's sharing here is a second tool to respond in constructively in the midst of relationship conflict, and that's timeliness. Okay? First, we need honesty, but second, you know what he says to us? You don't want relationships to explode. You come to that crossroads. You need timeliness because, yeah, you can be angry and you can be hurt. But if you don't deal with conflict, where basically the longer conflict goes unrecognized and unresolved, the bigger it gets. And the harder it becomes to resolve. Here's the truth that, you know, people say things, you know, like people say things, you can do anything you want, you set your mind to. You know, and it's, when you think about it, you're like, no, that's not true. You know, I can't, you know, jump off the Empire State Building and live. I just, you know, I can't be eight feet tall no matter how hard I want to be. It doesn't make sense. Well, here's something else that doesn't make sense. Time heals all wounds. Have people said that? You ever heard people say that? That's not true, especially in relationships. Time doesn't heal all wounds. Time is the enemy of good relationships uh, when there's conflict. Instead, not dealing with our pain, our anger, or an offense allows it to fester in us. So here's what Paul means when he says, hey, do it in a timely fashion. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. And then he says, you know why? Because it leaves no opportunity for the devil. You see, when conflict isn't dealt with, you know what happens? Satan starts to craft a new narrative in us. He starts to tell us lies. He's the father of lies. You know, around the situation and around the person, you know? And again, those lies, may, those lies may have to do with motive. The longer we don't deal with it, the more we say, oh, they meant to do that. Oh, this is, this is what this is, you know? And this was, this was on purpose, and it is, it is designed to just take me down, you know? And soon we start to see everything that person does through that offense and the assumed motives that then we put on a person. And now we can't ever look at anything they do in, with fresh eyes because we're seeing everything through the offense. And waiting or not doing things timely also gives us more time to air our grievance with others. The more time goes by, we say, I need to talk to somebody about this. 
and we start to then bring others into our camp, right? Um, and what that does is it helps, it, what it does is it doesn't help resolve a conflict. You know what it does? It poisons other people against that person where they might not have had anything against that person. Now you brought them into your offense and they take that on. Spreads it, right? And worst of all, delaying or failing to deal with conflict in a timely manner makes it so much harder to then bring it up the more time that goes by. And then if it is finally brought up after all that time, it's often too far gone to fix. So Paul says, don't let time go by. If you have something that you see, that, that you see somebody might have missed or that, you, that offended you, don't just sit on it. You know, go to God, get his perspective, but then go and deal with it. Because if you don't, it's just, it's like, a, it's like an open wound that you never treat and it starts to get infected and it starts to get worse and worse and soon you're cutting off your arm. And that's what, how relationships can just make things fall apart. So he said, so basically, this is what Paul's saying. Don't let conflict fester. Again, go to God, go to him. Honestly, with your pain and hurt, where we deal with it, oftentimes, right with him, that's heroic, isn't it? We go and we deal with God with the offense first before ever having to go to the person. Man, that's the ultimate, Right? But then we also find that God brings healing. First of all, by giving us perspective, you know, that he loves us, he's in control, and then by freeing us from holding that conflict against the person. So then we can go to God, and we can forgive that person. So instead of being against them, again, we can be for them, drawing us closer together. So timeliness is another tool. And this timeliness in dealing with conflict uh, then allows us to take up Paul's next tool. He says, so you want to do it timeliness? Here's how you do it timely. Verse 29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And then go down to verse 31. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. See, what Paul's talking about, he's, he's, he's kind of talking about our human condition and how we would respond in our flesh, right? Often when we're hurt and we feel exposed by another person and we don't deal with it honestly or quickly, we inevitably either feel like we need to make the other person feel as bad as we feel, so we want to hurt them back, or we want to make others think less of that person. So we talk bad about them. We tear them down, right? And as a result, we find ourselves doing what Paul cautions against. We talk bad about a person, or we talk bad to them, or we respond with bitterness. We seek revenge. We complain. Or we poison a person to others, which is what he means by the word slander. That's what slander is. Sowing discourse between people. And, you know, sometimes we do it the Christian way. And sometimes this happens the Christian way where we want to slander another person. And we do it the, the, the quote-unquote Christian way where we come to somebody and say, hey, I need you to pray for somebody. Can you pray for so-and-so? They have a real problem with being rude or talking bad or, or they have a real problem about talking about other people's issues behind their backs. So can you pray for that person? What you're really doing in that is you're not really asking for prayer. You're, you're wanting somebody else to know about your situation. And it's kind of the Christian way we do it, right? That's just as bad. We don't want to do that, right? In other words, what Paul's talking about in this caution is we seek to tear that person down. Instead, Paul urges us to respond constructively in the midst of this relationship conflict with what? With encouragement. So we respond when we, have, when we come to this crossroad with honesty, with timeliness, and with encouragement. Rather than tearing down, we're looking to build somebody up. 
You know, Matthew 18, and we were in Matthew 18 on Wednesday night at our parable class. If you haven't been out to parable class, you've got to come out to parable class. But we did Matthew 18, so I'm not going to tear it all apart because we did that Wednesday night. You can watch it on YouTube. But in Matthew 18, Jesus lays out a beautiful and a simple pattern for resolving conflict. Do you know that? In Matthew 18, here's what he says. If a brother sins against you, so if a fellow believer sins against you, then go to them personally. And basically, personally and privately, basically. So you don't go to others first. You go to them. And you deal with it. Now, if they don't listen, he says, well, then you're going to bring a witness or two. Now, this witness isn't, you're, you're not bringing people that are on your side, so everybody's dumping on the person. A witness in this case is you're bringing a witness to make sure that you too, the person you have conflict with, you can at least get everything out on the table and then that's been done. That's what a witness is. So they're a witness that things have been uh, shared and addressed, that the issue has been addressed, okay? Now, if the person still doesn't listen, then you go to the leaders of the church, is what Jesus says. Now, how often do we go elsewhere first? But Jesus gives us this, this order, and he gives it to us for a very important reason. In fact, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 18, because right after this, he says something pretty, pretty interesting. In verse 18, he says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my heavenly Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So the purpose of following this order that Jesus gives is to find healing rather than blame people. It's so that Jesus can be seen, right? He's there in our midst. He's visible in our midst. Rather than us being vindicated, Jesus is seen as the healer, as the one who brings together. And you know, what's really interesting about this verse, you, you, we, we read this, and maybe it sounded familiar to you where you hear, where two or three are gathered in my name, and there I am in their midst. What do we usually hear that in regards to? Prayer, Right? Isn't it interesting? It's not in regard to prayer here, is it? What's it in regard to? Relationship conflict. Jesus wants to be present in our relationship conflicts. That's the only way they're going to be healed. And the only way he can be present is if we do it in a godly manner. And he gives us the godly manner. Isn't that cool? That's what's going to build up because then he's going to be present and he's going to be seen in us. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So seeking to build up the other person that maybe have offended us or hurt us, it changes our entire perspective, doesn't it? It also helps us take up Paul's final tool in responding constructively as he goes on in the final verse of this chapter where he says this, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You want to know the biggest tool and probably and the, and the final tool in resolving conflict? Forgiveness. Forgiveness is where conflict comes to die. Do you know that? Forgiveness is where conflict comes to, God, to die. It can't exist. Where there's forgiveness. I mean, God forgiving us, our sins, right? Settles once and for all the offense of our sin against him. That's what sin is. It's an offense against God. We, we have attacked him. We have rebelled against him. Okay? And when God forgives us, it settles it. Restoring our relationship with him. In the same way, forgiving each other then frees us and it frees the person we forgive from any offense so that we can move forward in that relationship. Now, that sounds easy, but forgiveness is hard, isn't it? Do you know why forgiveness is hard? Because forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness isn't free. It always costs. And it usually costs the one who forgives. Look at with our sin. When God forgives us our sin, what did it cost him? Jesus became man. God himself came in the flesh and suffered 
the pain and all the suffering of our sin he took upon himself. You want to talk about a cost? And he died, died a horrible death on the cross to purchase our forgiveness. Forgiveness is always costly. So when we forgive another, why it's hard sometimes is because we're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute, that person offended me. They owe me something. They owe me apology. They owe me to, you know, grovel or to, to then lift me up after, you know, they owe me. So when we forgive a person, we're saying, nope, it's all good. And forgiving somebody doesn't mean we have to forget or that all of a sudden we have to completely trust somebody. It just means we wipe the slate clean. And you know, forgiveness is even harder though when somebody does the same thing over and over again. And that's where it gets even harder. In fact, when Jesus tells this, this uh, way of, of conflict resolution, one of his disciples, Peter, kind of thinks about this. And, and here's how, so he chimes in with the question. And he says to Jesus, Lord, verse 20, he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? You know, you talk about forgiveness, Jesus, and that's great. But what if they do it again and again and again? Now, the Jewish law said you had to do it three times. You were required to forgive somebody three times. Which, if you really think about it, if you've been offended by somebody and they've done the same thing three times, it's hard to forgive somebody three times. Well, look what P Peter offers. He's very generous. And he says, Lord, if somebody does this to me as many as seven times, I mean, it. that would be really great, wouldn't it? And again, I don't know. It's a struggle for me to do three times, let alone seven. And I'm sitting there going, wow. But look what Jesus does. He blows that out of the water. Verse 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times. I say 77, 70 times seven times. 490 times. Now, Jesus isn't meaning literally 490 times so that it's 490 firsts, you don't have to forgive somebody. What he's saying here with 490 times in, in, in Jewish culture when you use something like 70 times 7 because 7 was the number of perfection and completion, what he's basically saying is to infinity. Unlimited times. How often do we forgive somebody even when it's hard, no matter how hard it is? Every time. Now, I hear that and I say, man, I don't want to do that. Again, forgiveness is hard. And that's why in this setting where Jesus is talking about this, he tells us, but it's a matter of perspective. It's a lot easier to forgive if you have the right perspective. So he tells them a story to illustrate this, a parable. And the story is about a servant. And the servant owes his king a huge debt. In fact, if we rounded it up to our figures today, it'd be $7.2 billion dollars. This is a working man who makes minimum wage. There is no possible way he can ever pay that debt back, is there? Yet the king comes to him and says, the debt is due. And the man says, I can't pay it. Please, please give me more time. I'll just pay it if you give it more, me more time. Which he can if there's more time. But you know what the king does? He has mercy upon the guy. He doesn't just have mercy upon the guy to say, all right, you have more time to get things straightened out. It says, the king forgave him the debt. Wiped the slate clean. Forgiveness is costly. It just cost that king $7.2 billion that he will never see because he forgave that debt. But the king did it because he was full of mercy for that guy. You'd think, man, that's the greatest thing ever. But you know what the guy does? Jesus says, this servant then goes out from the king's presence and he's walking past his buddy. And his buddy, he owed him some money an infinitesimal fraction of what he owed the king. Just a small amount of money, something that anybody could repay if they set up a payment plan. And the servant looks at his buddy and says, give it to me now. And the guy says, I can't pay this. I don't have it right now. Give me some time. He says, nope. Says he put his hands around his neck and he threw him in jail. He said, I'm not forgiving you. When the king heard about that, he calls the servant in. He says, You're, you wicked servant, what are you doing? I forgave you this great and you can't forgive this guy. You know what? That debt that I wiped clean, no, it's now back on the books. And he has the guy arrested. And Jesus kind of closed it out and said, you know what? What this king did is going to happen to each one of us if we can't forgive our brother from our heart. 
But what Jesus is doing here is he's talking about perspective. And in this story, the king represents God, okay, who forgives a great debt, sin against him, that can never be repaid by us no matter how much time we have, no matter how many good works we do, we can never repay it. Yet the king forgives it. That debt, that offense against God that he has forgiven is so much greater than any debt any other person could owe us or any offense somebody could do to us. That's what he's saying by this. It's so much greater, it pales in comparison when we see it from this perspective. So, and when we do see it from this perspective, then we should forgive each other because God forgave us. It means nothing in the grand scheme of things. In fact, truly forgiving each other is only possible when we grasp God's forgiveness for us. I mean, without God's forgiveness, we have nothing, do we? So what does it matter if somebody makes something up to us if we have nothing anyway? And even if they give it back to us, we get something from somebody, we'll still have nothing. But with God's forgiveness, we have everything we need. We don't need anything. So why not forgive somebody of anything they may do? It's not going to change where we are with God. That's what Jesus is saying in this story. You see, and here's an important truth. Forgiving another person has nothing to do with that person earning it, deserving it, or even asking for our forgiveness. Forgiving another person has everything to do with us grasping the enormity of God forgiving us. I'm going to say that again. Forgiving others has nothing to do with a person deserving our forgiveness, earning our forgiveness, okay, or even asking for forgiveness or doing something that wasn't that bad. It has nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with us grasping the enormity of God forgiving us because once we grasp that, why not forgive? That's why Paul closes that and said, forgiving as God in Christ has forgiven you. Isn't that huge? In this, our struggle to forgive others then is linked rather than, well, they really did something to me and it really hurt and they did this 20 times. Instead, the issue isn't what somebody else did. Rather, it's where is our trust and appreciation of God's forgiveness from us? You see, that relationship with others, that conflict hinges on us understanding our relationship with God. That's huge, isn't it? That's why really among believers and within the church, that's the only place relationships truly can be free and clean. Because we have been forgiven by God. When we do and we freely forgive each other, you know what happens? We then reflect God's gift of forgiveness to others. So people can see the greatness of what Jesus has done for us. How can that person forgive that person? Well, be, you know why I can forgive that person? Because Jesus has forgiven me. And he can forgive you too. What a testimony. So actually resolving conflict doesn't have to be something that tears us apart. It can actually be something that, that is a testimony of the greatness of God in our life. And what others may have in Jesus. Talk about turning something from being something that we just look at and say, this is the worst thing ever that could have happened, to saying, what an opportunity we have. Through healthy relationships, to see Christ glorified and to share him with, every, with others. Again, relationships are messy. I mean, let's not beat around the bush. But, when they're healthy in the church and among believers, they reflect Jesus to our world. So when we have conflict, let's just kind of go over these steps that Paul shares with us. First of all, be honest about, about our hurt, about our pain with, with ourselves, with God, and with others so that God's truth will reign. 
We do this for the benefit of ourselves and our relationship with God and the one who wrongs us. Then he says, you know, and for that benefit, deal with it in a timely manner. So be honest, be timely. And make sure we deal with it, however. Make sure when we deal with it, it's done God's way. Building up rather than tearing down. And he gives us this model in in Matthew chapter 18, right? And actually, we all have a role in this then. We have a role as a church family and with each other to make sure that we're resolving conflict in a godly manner. We have a, we have a respons- personal responsibility to say, you know what, I'm going to do it God's way. But we also have a responsibility, if somebody's not doing it God's way, to put a stop to it. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and they're trying to tear down somebody else to you? Maybe they're doing it in a way of asking for advice, but really they're, they're, they're poisoning you. Or they're sharing gossip or they're trying to build, in, build a, you know, allies or something. Have you ever had somebody do that? I know I have. I know I've done it to people. Do you know what stops it? Somebody saying, I don't want to hear it. That's not right for you to tell me that. You need to talk to that person first. So when somebody comes to you, we can stop a lot of that by just saying, have you talked to the person yet? Are you dealing with this in a godly way? You see, if somebody has nothing to tell these things to, they won't tell it. And it's a way we can put a stop to it. So we all can have a role in this and helping each other with this. And again, we send them to that model to follow that Jesus gives. And in this way, we protect each other. We also protect the church. And finally, Paul says, you know, pray for the grace to forgive others anything. Just as God in Jesus has first forgiven us. Remember, Forgiveness is where conflict goes to die. Conflict has no power to tear apart where forgiveness is found. So hopefully as we move forward as a church, as as we're saying, all right, we're ready to go back, you know, we're ready for healing, we're ready for God to be glorified in us. One of the ways we can do that is by committing ourselves to healthy relationships. And next week we're going to start looking at 1 Timothy, which... Paul and Timothy talks to him about other ways that we function as a healthy church with our mission from God. But it starts here with our relationships with each other so that we can be committed to building healthy relationships in the unity of the Spirit, as Paul says. So our world can see Jesus at work in us. Again, our world doesn't need to see perfection in us. It needs to see Jesus changing us and the power of Jesus transforming our lives and transforming our relationships as they reflect him. So let's pray.